Will you pray with me? Thou art a sea without a shore, a sun without a sphere. Thy time is now and evermore. Thy place is everywhere. To invoke is to provoke. To provoke is to listen closely. To listen closely is to open our hearts, our minds, our spirits, our souls, our bodies, to celebrate the spirit that surrounds us, the sea without a shore, the sun without a sphere. So we gather this day to celebrate your presence, O oh God, here in this abode of teaching and learning, this space where we two-step with faith and intellect, where we foster the love and knowledge of God with our minds, aware that Christianity lives in the global, in the multi-faith, in those spaces where people's lives are shaped and find meaning, their joys, their sorrows, their fears, their anger, their hopes. Where we seek to train leaders for the church and all two human worlds found in your good creation, aware that we live in the hard edges and in breathtaking galaxies. So we name those hard edges and seek to extinguish them with our commitments to justice. We craft those spaces of beauty with music, image, worship, and ritual. Like the dis disciples, we are a motley crew seeking to be faithful. And we gather this day to celebrate a new beginning that is also an old one. We gather to install Reverend Dr. Dean Brother Greg with high spirits, great hopes, committed steadfastness. And we ask, we ask, oh God, that you bless his deanship, that you hold Adrian and their families in, their, in your prayers, that you wrap all of us with anticipation for the future that is unfolding before us and within us. And guide us, oh heavenly mind bender as we seek to run on to see what your good end will be. Abide with us and help us to unfold into your tarrying spirit, morning by morning and day by day. Blessed be your presence and blessed are we who receive it. And those gathered who could said, amen. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes. And I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep thy law. And preserve it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of thy commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to thy testimonies and not to gain. Turn my eyes from looking at vanities. And give me life in thy ways. Confirm to thy servant thy promise. Turn away the reproach which I dread. For thy ordinances are good. Behold, I long for thy precepts. In thy righteousness give me life. Let thy steadfast love come to me, O Lord. Of thy salvation according to thy promise. Then shall I have an answer for those who taunt me. For I trust in thy word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth. For my I will keep thy law continually, forever and ever. And I shall walk at liberty, for I have sought the precepts. For I find my delight in thy commandments, which I love. I revere thy commandments, and I will meditate on thy statutes. I long for thy salvation, O Lord. And thy law is my delight. Be seated.
A reading from the letter to the Ephesians. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you, and how the mystery was made known to me by a revelation, as I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Jesus Christ our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. I pray, therefore, that you may not lose heart over my sufferings for you. They are your glory. The word of God for the people of God. We come together on this splendid occasion to celebrate the powerful and enduring mission of Yale Divinity School as we formally install its new leader. The Divinity School opened in 1822, but its foundation, in fact, goes back to the very origins of Yale College 121 years earlier. Religious beliefs motivated our founders Theology was at the heart of the early curriculum of the college, and the new school's declared purpose was to educate men to be fitted for public employment both in church and civil state. It is suitable to remember that controversy about religion is as old as Yale itself. Our founders drew a sharp distinction between their own devout Puritanism and the very suspicious high church deviationism of their Massachusetts alma mater. And I dare say, 45 years later, the six Yaleys who participated in the founding of Princeton, not to mention Yale's greatest cleric, Jonathan Edwards, who soon thereafter served briefly as Princeton's president, they thought that their own alma mater had strayed from the true path <laughs> in just a short time. More than a century later, in 1861, only one generation after its establishment, the new divinity school found itself mired in crisis and controversy. Most of the faculty who have served the school with distinction, who had served the school with distinction in the 40 years since its founding had passed away and the school seemed adrift. But the Reverend Timothy Dwight the Younger, Yale's 12th president and a direct descendant of Jonathan Edwards, was determined to revive the young school. President Dwight wrote, we were young men with much of the hope and energy belonging to the age. We determined to make the venture. We put in exercise the faith, the faith which is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Ten years later, having survived the dark days of the Civil War, Dwight reported that the student body, which in the old days had been limited mainly to graduates of Yale College, now was, compromised, now was comprised of young men from all over the country. The school had begun to attract students of different religious denominations, and the faculty were, in Dwight's words, enthusiastic for the work. In sum, Dwight concludes, 
the days of uncertainty and discouragement had passed away and the new day of might and success had come. Today, as we install a new dean, the scope and the vitality of the Yale Divinity School is broader than even President Dwight could have imagined. Those who study here are of many faiths and creeds, united in a common search for the meaning of human existence and experience, sharing a common belief that the life of the spirit must take its place alongside the life of the mind in a great institution of higher learning. Those who study here seek not only learning and understanding, but also preparation to lead communities of faith throughout the nation and the wider world. Let us hope that 10 years from now, we can look back upon this moment of reaffirmation and rededication with the same sense of satisfaction and accomplishment that Reverend Dwight experienced looking back a century and a quarter ago. Through our history, we have been blessed by the emergence of individuals who have been especially appropriate to the needs and requirements of the particular moment. As we formally pass the stewardship of this great school from one dean to another, we pause to think of those leaders who have helped to carry out our mission and bring us to this juncture. Former Deans Attridge, Chop, Wood, Ogletree, and Keck. We thank them for their devoted service, energy, commitment, humanity, and compassion. We thank most especially Harry Attridge for 10 years of extraordinary leadership, during which time the renovation of the school's facilities was completed, the faculty strengthened, and the endowment augmented. With equal gratitude, we thank Greg Sterling for agreeing to take up the calling. We entrust the stewardship of the school to this outstanding scholar and committed churchman who has already demonstrated as Dean of the Graduate School at Notre Dame, exceptional leadership and creativity. This community welcomes his open and collaborative style and his devotion to service. His candidacy was enthusiastically endorsed by the search committee and he has the full support of the university as he leads the school to carry out its mission of preparing students for the ordained and lay ministries of the Christian churches, encouraging the study of all religions in a university environment and shaping the role of religion in society by providing theological education for leaders of the future. With pride in this great school, with firm commitment to its health and strength, with the faith that is the substance of things hoped for and evidence of things unseen, and by the authority vested in me by the Yale Corporation, I take great pleasure in installing you, Gregory E. Sterling, the 14th Dean of the Yale Divinity School. also preparing a class on messianic expectation. <laughs> <laughs> and I wondered if some of it might be applicable. <laughs> there is actually a prayer or a blessing for the Messiah in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it goes like this. May the Lord raise you up to everlasting heights and as a fortified tower upon a wall. May he make your horns of iron and your hooves of bronze May you toss like a young bull and trample people in like the mire of the streets. <laughs> well, one does hear of deans who are like that. <laughs> actually, a couple of them were recommended to us in the course of research. Uh, but it is not actually the model that we have back. Uh, I say a chapter 11 works a little bit better. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. 
Now, of course, the job description for a dean and for a messiah are not quite the same thing. <laughs> it is often said in messianic texts that the wealth of the nations would flow into Jerusalem. <laughs> but I think the prophets underestimated the kind of fundraising work that made <laughs> <in> the <Bible. laughs> But what I would most like to say to you today is that when you lie awake thinking about the deficit, think also about what it's all for. Uh, for the last 20 years, we have been blessed to have a president who understood and was very supportive, has been and continues to be very supportive of the Divinity School. Within the year, a new pharaoh will arrive. <laughs> professional training for ministry and preparation for higher education. Our main business is to foster the understanding of religion and its place in society in the hope that religion can bring people together and not divide us as it so often does in the modern world. We do not actually expect or even need you to be a messiah, right? But we do hope that you will on occasion find a prophetic voice to remind us of what it is that we should really be about.
I'm deeply grateful we sang a prayer after John's comments. <clears throat> because as I thought about his references to Messiah, it reminded me, would I be given anything as a symbol? Would I be given a crown? And I said, the only crown that I think a dean ever gets has thorns, and I would prefer to pass. <laughs> but I'm very grateful, President Levin, Provost Salave, John, all of the distinguished members of the platform party, to each of you who have come, my beloved colleagues, my family, my dearly beloved, and the many alumni who are here. And I have to recognize one particular alumna today because she graduated in 1940 from this institution. She is now only three years short of celebrating her 100th birthday. I refer to the Reverend Elizabeth Frazier. We are deeply grateful for your presence. It is hard for me, who have devoted my life to the study of Philo of Alexandria, not to recall a remarkable autobiographical statement that the greatest ancient interpreter of the Jewish scriptures made. When he was selected to lead the Jewish embassy before the emperor Caligula, following the violent pogrom that erupted in Alexandria in the year 38. As he thought about the two major commentaries series that he had written on Genesis and Exodus, he lamented the loss of time that he could devote to the truly blessed life of the mind. He realized that the eruption of violence and the future welfare of the enormous Jewish community in Alexandria had inexorably drawn him into the great sea of civil concerns. Nevertheless, he continued to reflect on scripture and went on to write a third and comprehensive commentary on the entire Pentateuch. I think about this statement because I did not begin my career with aspirations of administration. <laughs> like my Jewish colleague, I was enamored with the life of the mind and the freedom it afforded to reflect on the text that means so much to me. Yet like Philo, I find myself in a position that I had not anticipated. My own way of contrasting my life as a faculty member with my life as a dean is much simpler. I was once paid to do what I love to do, and now I earn my living. <laughs> Yet let me be clear. I consider the deanship of Yale Divinity School to be the highest honor of my life. Like Philo, I will not abandon my first love, the scriptures, and the meaning that they give life. And so on this occasion, I turn to a Deuteropauline letter that addresses the world before us as I see it. The world of Christianity must have looked complex to the disciple of Paul who wrote Ephesians. A Jewish renewal movement that had begun in Galilee and Judea had spread throughout the Roman world in limited numbers, but with breathtaking speed. The geographical and cultural diversity that characterized this movement meant that it was not uniform. While there were common elements, the diversity of specific liturgical expressions would probably have bewildered someone who visited a largely Gentile church in Corinth and a Christian synagogue in Jerusalem as much as a contemporary traveler today might be perplexed who wandered into a charismatic service in the US and a high mass in Rome. Even more profound than the liturgical expressions would have been the ethnic divide, a movement that had begun exclusively among Jewish adherents 
had swollen in numbers with people who had no ties to Judaism. The entrance of Gentiles who did not observe Jewish laws had driven a wedge between the Jewish community and the now distinct Christian community. Christians were no longer a Jewish renewal movement, but a movement with their own developing identity. But what was that identity? How should Christians understand their place in the Roman world? There were several efforts to answer this fundamental question, including one by the author of Ephesians, who understood Paul as the key figure in the development of Christianity. For a few minutes, I would like to reflect on the answer of Ephesians as a means of helping us think through how our place in the 21st century can be improved and instructed. The author of Ephesians was familiar with the story of Paul and had access to some of his letters as well as those of his immediate associates, letters that our author recast to address the church after Paul. The second reading today is one of the most remarkable examples of this reinterpretation. The author of Ephesians took a single mystery disclosure in Colossians and created two mystery disclosures in Ephesians 3. The literary form of a mystery disclosure typically involves five elements, an explicit reference to God's mystery, a temporal reference that contrasts the past when the mystery was hidden with the present when it is disclosed, a reference to the revelation of the mystery, the group to whom the mystery has been revealed, and the agent by which the revelation has been given. Here is the mystery disclosure in Colossians. I, Paul, became a minister of the church according to the administration of God that was given to me for you to make the word of God known, the mystery that was hidden for eons and for generations but now has been disclosed to his holy ones. The author of Ephesians took this single mystery disclosure and created two disclosures. The rationale for doubling the disclosure in Colossians is that the author understood the temporal markers, eons, and generations to refer to celestial beings and humans. This required a revelation to each of the two groups. The author reversed the order in Colossians and made humans the first group and celestial beings the second group. But the author did something more. In the first disclosure of the mystery to humans, he broke the disclosure into two movements. The first came to Paul and the second to the apostles. In this way, the author privileged Paul above the holy apostles and prophets by placing him first. It is highly likely that the author knew different traditions of Christian origins, one that gave the privilege of opening the door to the Gentiles to the apostles, one can think of the role of Peter in Acts, and one that credited Paul with opening this door. Our author has made it unambiguously clear that Paul was the key. The author next addressed the celestial beings in a second revelation disclosure. The celestial beings were the last to learn of God's mystery. They only came to understand it when they saw it lived out in the church where both Jew and Gentile had access to God. In this way, the author brought earth and heaven together as witnesses to the great mystery of God, the union of all people in Christ Jesus. This was a new construction of Christian origins. As the author stood at the end of the first or beginning of the second century and looked back over the evolution of Christianity, the author realized that Paul's vision for a single church consisting of Jew and Gentile had become a reality. At the same time, the author also understood that Paul had not thought through what this reality was. Paul had fought for the equal rights of Gentiles as Christians. 
But his letters had all been addressed to specific locales with the problems and limits that each faced. The apostle had never, not even in Romans, attempted to articulate a theology for a unified church throughout the Roman world. Drawing from Paul's occasional letters, our author attempted to build an understanding of a global church that was both faithful to the vision of Paul and at the same time extended that vision well beyond what the apostle had imagined. In a bold move, the author dared to create a vision of a worldwide church that included everyone without respect to race or background. What does this have to do with us in the 21st century? More specifically, what does it have to do with the installation of a dean at Yale Divinity School? Like the author who looked back on the events of the first century and felt the seismic changes that had taken place, we now look back on the 20th century and feel the tectonic plates shifting beneath our feet. We sense at least three fundamental changes. The first change is the decline of the religious bodies that have nourished most of us. Yale Divinity School has been a leader among mainline Protestant denominations throughout the 20th century. Unfortunately, since the 60s, half of the people who have grown up in mainline Protestant denominations have left. The case is just as severe for Roman Catholics, where 60% of American Catholics have left the church of their youth. The only Christian religious group predicted to grow in the next 40 years is the Hispanic Catholic population. All other groups, liberal and conservative alike, are predicted to decline. Barbara Brown Taylor, one of our own beloved alums, captured the spirit of the age in her book, Leaving Church. The studies of Robert Putnam and David Campbell and the recent Pew study have emphasized the rapid growth of the nuns, and that is not N-U-N-S, <laughs> N-O-N-E-S, those who consider themselves spiritual but have no desire to belong to religious institutions. Diana Butler Bass has pointed out this issue in her Christianity after religion, the end of the church and the birth of a new spiritual awakening. And Harvey Cox, another alum of this institution, has called the period we are entering the age of the spirit. What all of these realize is that Christianity as an ecclesial expression is in a state of decline in North America. A second major shift is taking place. Christianity, like the population of the U.S., is moving south. It is not moving south to the warmer climes of Florida and Arizona, but to the continents of Africa and Latin America. The global distribution of Christians has changed dramatically over the last century. From 1910 to 2010, the worldwide percentage of Christians in Europe dropped from 67% to 25%. In the Americas, this is both North and South, it grew from 27 to 37%. But in Africa, it jumped from 2% to 24%. John Allen, a reporter who covers the Vatican, argued in his book, The Future Church, that by 2025, one in six Catholics worldwide will be African. Latin America is the other stronghold. After the US, Brazil and Mexico have the largest number of Christians worldwide. We cannot ignore the diminution of Christianity in the Northern Hemisphere or the rapid rise or preponderance of Christianity in the Southern Hemisphere. There is a third shift that we must take into account, globalization. Tom Freeman captured the nature of the age in which we now live 
when he proclaimed, the world is flat. We do not and cannot live in an isolated corner of the world. It would be irresponsible for us to try to do so. While Christians are the largest religious group in the world at 33%, we are followed closely by Muslims at 25%. We cannot ignore those who have different expressions of faith. Thinking globally and interreligiously are not options. They are requirements for living in the 21st century. How should we respond to these three major changes? It is here that I come back to Philo and to the disciple of Paul and look toward scripture. In my case, I return to Paul's disciple by offering three reflections based on Ephesians. First, the author of Ephesians did not elect to write an entirely new set of correspondence for Paul like some of his successors did in 3 Corinthians or the exchange with the Stoic philosopher Seneca. Rather, the disciple of Paul elected to use Paul's own letters to create a new theology. The author of Ephesians knew and used at least five letters, of five genuine letters of Paul and two Deuteropauline letters. The result was not, however, a haphazard collection of Pauline fragments, but a magisterial work of art that has been admired by many. Martin Luther, for example, called Ephesians the true kernel and marrow of the New Testament. C.H. Dodd, one of the greatest New Testament scholars of the 20th century, labeled Ephesians the crown of Pauline writings. Yale Divinity School has for many years offered outstanding training in the basic theological disciplines. I pledge to continue that tradition. The author of Ephesians did not face the future by jettisoning the past, but by steeping himself or herself in it and learning how to rework it. I am committed to maintaining the unparalleled tradition that has shaped and honed the minds of Yale Divinity School students in the classic theological disciplines. It has been and will remain a hallmark of Yale Divinity School. Second, as important as Paul's letters were to the author of Ephesians, the author did not simply repeat them. The author drew from them faithfully but extended them creatively in a way that reached out to the church of the second century. Our task is not simply to understand Paul or other writers of scripture or Christian theology, but to extend their thought in creative ways that remain both faithful to the past while engaging the future. In short, Ephesians does not call us to turn to the past, but to use the past to face the future. It does not call us to turn ad intra within our ecclesial enclaves, but to turn ad extra to the entire world. It does not call us to petrify our understanding of scripture in the face of change, but to think through the implications of the scriptures that open us up to the larger world. It does not urge us to guard God's grace, but to offer it to all. We will try some things that we have not done previously. We will routinely offer one hour courses led by those who have been phenomenally successful in various careers while well guided by the theology. They will come from government, not for profits, large parishes or congregations, corporations, and yes, even law firms. <laughs> they will serve as models for our students for what it means to live an ethical life in a complex world. We will work hard to bring people from throughout the world to our campus, including those from beyond the Christian faith to rethink our own theology in light of the southward movement of Christianity and the need to relate our faith to those with other faiths. I will personally make a concerted effort to marshal the incredible resources of Yale in a project that I'm wanting to call 
the Yale Initiative on Faith and Peace to make religion a force that promotes peace and wellness rather than violence and disparity in our world. The ecumenical vision of Ephesians that embraced Jew and Gentile lies as a gauntlet at our feet to reach across the spectrum of Christianity and become a place where God's society serves as a model for human society. Third, the author of Ephesians offers one other perspective that we must not overlook, even though it has seldom been noticed. Ephesians devotes more attention to prayer than any other letter in the Pauline corpus. 549 of the 2,395 words, yes, I am a New Testament scholar, <laughs> or 23% of the total words are part of the prayer text that serve as the structural markers of Ephesians. The text that we have examined today is immediately followed by a prayer that marks the transition from the argumentatio in chapters one and three to the exhortatio in chapters four through six. Why place prayers at the opening, transitional, and closing sections of the letter? I suggest that the prayers are invitations for us to reflect on the theology of the letter. As Luke Timothy Johnson, who once taught at this institution, said, in Ephesians, theology informs the prayer and the prayer itself is the vehicle for theology. We listen to the voice of God while on our knees, but we do not only listen, we think through the meaning of what we have studied. Prayer must continue to be a focal point of life at Yale Divinity School. It is the place where our motto becomes a reality. Faith and intellect meet when we bend our knees and raise our faces to God. There is an urgent need for us to think about theology and the church afresh. We should not and must not begin de novo. We must begin just as the author of Ephesians began with the sources that have shaped our identity. We cannot, however, simply repeat those sources or our interpretations of them. The world has changed, and so must we. The author of Ephesians saw this and extended the apostles' thought to give a new vision to the church, a vision that had endured for centuries. But our world is changing again, perhaps more radically than at any time in the last 500 years. We are now called upon to think afresh to reimagine the church in the 21st century. We are called upon to live God's society in a way that will speak to human society. We need not do this alone. We must do so in dependence upon God who gave shape to the past and who will shape the future. I think that Ludwig Wittgenstein understood the meaning of prayer while he served as a soldier in the Austrian 11th Army during the Russian offensive, he wrote in one of his notebooks, to pray is to think about the meaning of life. I invite you to think about the meaning of life as we join our intellects and our faith to create God's society on earth. Thank you. Let us join in prayer. God of majesty beyond all praising, 
Bless this school where wisdom and learning may walk together and where justice and compassion may join hands. We thank you for the generations of faculty, administrators, staff, and students who have kept alive the mission of the Divinity School to prepare leaders for service in church and world at a time of dramatic shifts in the theological landscape. We thank you for countless students who embark on the adventure of theological education while gaining in wise dealing, righteousness, justice, and equity and have gone forth to be ministers of your word and mentors for God's people. Bless this school where people of all faiths and newcomers to our nation may pursue their deepest aspirations for truth, the truth that sets them free, and experience that deep paradox of biblical faith proclaimed by Abraham Joshua Heschel, that humans do not search for God, but God is pursuing men and women, as if God is unwilling to be alone and had chosen them to serve him. With the prayer of the psalmist, we ask your blessing on Gregory. May his mouth speak wisdom and may the meditation of his heart be understanding. Grant him to seek whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, and all things worthy of praise. Give him strength and courage as church and society embark on a journey fraught with new challenges and new opportunities in a world threatened by violence, attacks on basic human rights, and the destruction of the beauty of your creation. Grace him with family and friends who can share with him the birth of new hopes and new visions and stand by him when the shadows lengthen and the dawn of a new day seems distant. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and grant you peace.